Hello, so last time we discussed compact operators and we looked at one example of a compact operator, the Volterra operator. The example can easily be generalized and we are going to di discuss a whole range of operators called Hilbert Schmidt operator. This is not the definition of Hilbert Schmidt, but these are examples of Hilbert Schmidt operators. So the most basic example of compact operators are these classes of operators. The study of compact operators is a very vast chapter in functional analysis, but we are going to only look at those aspects which are relevant for generalized Fourier series and Fourier expansions. So that's the example number one that you see on the slide. Example one, the Hilbert Schmidt operator T from L2 of 0, 1 to L2 of 0, 1 given by T fx equal to integral 0 to 1 kxt f of t dt. Now I had taken a compact interval 0, 1 for convenience and for illustration purposes one could take more general measure spaces and one can look at L2 of those. But I am also going to restrict myself to begin with continuous functions kxt. This kxt will be called a kernel function. So it is an integral operator with a kernel. So this is going to be a compact operator. First of all, observe that since k is continuous on 0, 1 cross 0, 1, it is uniformly continuous. This uniform continuity of k is going to immediately uh, give us the equicontinuity or the family Tfx. So let us look at this output Tfx. Input is f of x and the output is Tfx. So now by uniform continuity, given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a delta greater than 0 such that mod x minus y less than delta implies mod kxt minus kyt less than epsilon. Here I have taken the second variable t to be the same and it is the first variable x that is changing. So k of xt minus k of yt, that modulus is less than epsilon. So now let us estimate it. So let us look at what is tfx minus tfy. Tfx minus Tfy will be, I am applying the triangle inequality, integral 0 to 1, the mod goes inside the integral, kxt minus kyt into mod f of t dt. Now remember that by appealing to uniform continuity, this is less than epsilon, so the epsilon comes out and I am left out with mod f t dt and this integral is less than or equal to norm of f by Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and I am going to assume that norm f is less than or equal to 1, the L2 norm mind you and so what we get is that this family Tfx is equicontinuous. To establish uniform boundedness, we simply take the supremum m of kxt dt and proceed along similar lines, mod Tfx is less than or equal to integral 0 to 1 mod kxt into mod f of t dt, mod kxt has been dominated by m and again apply Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, you will get this L2 norm of f here and that is less than or equal to m. So all the functions tfs are uniformly bounded by m. So the family is equicontinuous and uniformly bounded. So as soon as norm f is less than 1, the corresponding family of functions tfx will be a pre-compact with respect to which norm? With respect to supnorm. Remember that the oscoli arzela theorem concerns supnorm. So we got that the family T of fx is pre-compact with respect to the supnorm, which means that given any sequence as a subsequence converging uniformly. But uniform convergence will imply L2 convergence. We are on a compact interval 0, 1. There is no problem. And so the family Tfx as f varies over the unit ball in L2 will be pre-compact in L2 norm also and thereby we have finished showing that this operator is a compact operator. Now how do these kinds of Hilbert Schmidt operators arise in the context of differential equations, in the context of boundary value problems of ODEs with a two-point boundary value problem. That is equation 7.23. We are looking at y double prime plus lambda rho xy equal to f of x, y of 0 equal to 0 and y of 1 equal to 0. We are looking at Dirichlet boundary conditions. So now let us look at this 
equation 7.23 and we are going to prove that when you try to solve 7.23 we can convert this into an integral operator and the solution y of this equation 7.23 can be obtained as an integral of f of x with k of x t dt where k is a certain kernel and we want to derive this kernel look at its properties and so on that's the job for the next few slides and for the rest of the capsule so let us first assume that lambda is not an eigenvalue of the homogeneous problem okay so when i put a zero on the right hand side lambda is not an eigenvalue so the problem with zero rhs has only the trivial solution which means that the inhomogeneous problem 7.23 if at all it has a solution can only have one solution let us compare this with the elementary situation that we encounter in linear algebra courses namely solving systems of linear equations ax equal to b so when you have a system of linear equations ax equal to b if ax equal to 0 has only the trivial solution that means if the kernel of a is trivial then the inhomogeneous equation ax equal to b has at most one solution either it has no solution or it has a unique solution that we know from basic linear algebra and the situation here is very similar so we are assuming that lambda is not an eigenvalue so the associated homogeneous equation has only a trivial solution so the inhomogeneous equation if it has a solution that solution will have to be unique so now let us examine whether 7.23 has a solution at all so if it has a solution then that solution will be unique and so that will define for me an operator the input is f of x and that unique solution will be the output and thereby you get a mapping from l2 of 0 1 to l2 of 0 1 and that will be linear suppose you solve 7.23 with f of x and you solve 7.23 with g of x again then i can call the solutions y and z then y plus z will be the solution of the corresponding problem with f plus g on the right hand side so the solution operator is going to be linear with respect to this input f of x and this linear transformation will map l2 of 0 1 to l2 of 0 1 and that's exactly what we want to check so let us assume that y1 and y2 are two solutions of the homogeneous problem y double prime plus lambda rho x y equal to 0 and let us take initial conditions for y1 and y2 what are the initial conditions i'm taking y1 of 0 is 1 y1 prime of 0 is 0 y2 of 0 is 0 y2 prime 0 is 1 so why have i taken these initial conditions what is the ronskian at the origin the ronskian at the origin is a identity matrix and so the value of the ronskian is 1 and so the solutions y1 and y2 are linearly independent once you got two linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation how do i solve the inhomogeneous equation with f of x on the right hand side the method of variation of parameters that you teach your undergraduate students at the sophomore level which we need to recall so according to the method of variation of parameters since the solution of the inhomogeneous problem which is known as the particular integral or the particular solution is obtained how it is obtained in the form 7.26 namely v1x y1x plus v2x y2x this technique goes back to lagrange and lagrange was motivated by this in his researches in celestial mechanics specifically the orbit of comets i have written a paper on the geometrical interpretation or the method of variation of parameters if your curiosity has been aroused you can consult this paper so now let us get on with the solution so v1 and v2 have to be determined how do i determine v1 and v2 there are two equations determining v1 and v2 the first one is the osculatory condition v1 prime y1 plus v2 prime y2 equal to 0 and the second condition is v1 prime y1 prime plus v2 prime y2 prime is f now remember that these are two equations for v1 prime and v2 prime and what are the determinant of these two equations y1 y2 y1 prime y2 prime the wrong skin of y1 and y2 and the wrong skin of y1 and y2 is never going to be 0 it's going to be constant and it's going to be 1 throughout 
by the abel level formula the ronskian is going to be constant because there is no y prime term in the differential equation and the value of the ronskian at the origin is 1 so when you solve these two equations using the kramer's rule the denominator is going to be 1 there is no problem so let us solve them by kramer's rule you can immediately solve them and you will get v1x in fact, you're going to get V1 prime x equal to minus Y2 x f of x and V2 prime x is going to be Y1 x f of x. So you need to perform one integration and we integrate from 0 so that you make it a definite integral. So V1 x is minus integral 0 to x Y2 t f of t dt. V2 x is integral 0 to x Y1 t f of t dt. So we have found V1 and V2 and we need to substitute over here in 7.26 and write down the particular integral. So we get the particular solution is integral combining these two things 0 to chi Y1 t Y2 chi minus Y1 chi Y2 t f of t dt and let us write this as k of chi t f of t dt where the kernel k chi t is basically k chi t equal to y1 t y2 chi minus y1 chi y2 t of a t less than or equal to chi and k of chi t is 0 when t is greater than or equal to chi. The kernel is continuous on 0 1 cross 0 1. Why is the kernel continuous on the rectangle 0 1 cross 0 1? Because what is the value of the kernel? When chi and t are equal, when chi and t are equal, what's the, what's the situation? It is 0, y1 t y2 t minus y1 t y2 t. So for t less than or equal to chi, al along the boundary t equal to chi, it is 0. When t is greater than or equal to chi, anyway it is 0. So the function is defined in two different ways in the two triangles t less than or equal to chi and t greater than or equal to chi, correct? And along the interface, the two prescriptions match. So by the basic gluing lemma from elementary metric space theory, the combined thing is continuous. So k is a continuous function, the kernel is continuous and so we are going to get a Hilbert-Schmidt operator, but we are not quite done we have a small problem. Namely, we cannot simply take y of x equal to integral 0 to x k of x t f of t dt. That will not do. We need to make sure that the boundary conditions are satisfied. We need to make sure that the boundary conditions are satisfied. And in order to do that, we have to modify the solution by adding c1 y1 x plus c2 y2 x where c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants and we need to choose these constants c1 and c2 in such a way that the boundary conditions are satisfied. So let us put x equal to 0, y of 0 equal to 0 that straight away gives you c1 equal to 0. Okay, because the left hand side will be 0. So c1 y1 of 0. What is y1 of 0? y1 of 0 is 1, remember? And y2 of 0 is 0. So this goes, this becomes 1 and the integral becomes 0. So straight away c1 is 0. Now you put x equal to 1, you want y of 1 to be 0, so that this will become 0. Now what happens is that you will get c1 is anyway 0, you will get c2 times y2 of 1 plus integral 0 to 1 k of x t f of t dt but x is going to be 1. So here you are going to put a 1 here and integral 0 to 1 k of 1 t f of t and the c2 value is minus 1 upon y2 of 1. Now here I am dividing by y2 of 1. How can I conveniently divide? How can I be sure that y2 of 1 is not 0? We have got to make sure of that. Because if y2 of 1 is 0, it would mean that y2 of 0 is already 0, y2 of 1 is already 0 and y2 is a eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda and that is a contradiction because we are expressly ruled out the lambda being an eigenvalue. We are not allowed the lambda to be an eigenvalue. So y2 of 1 is non-zero and so division by y2 of 1 is legal and we obtain my c2 as well. So let us put the value of c1 and c2 and let us write the solution properly. The solution y of x is now incorporating the c2 1 upon y2 of 1 integral 0 to 1 k x t y2 of 1 minus k 1 t y2 of x f of t dt. That's exactly what we got. 
and this entire expression you take the y2 under the integral sign and combine all these things and call it g x t f of t dt. So, what is g of x t? k x t y2 of 1 minus k 1 t y2 of x upon y2 of 1. That complicated expression is called g of x t. This is called the Green's function for the boundary value problem. Remember, when you are talking about a Green's function, you may have already encountered this word Green's function in undergraduate differential equations courses. It is very popular to see a section on Green's functions in all these textbooks. But we have to remember one thing that the, you cannot talk about the Green's function for a differential equation. You have got to give me the differential equation and you have got to give me the problem. Are you talking about an initial value problem? Then you have got to tell me what the initial conditions are. Are you giving me a boundary value problem? Then you have to tell me what the boundary values are. So, the Green's function is something that corresponds to a specific problem. The differential equation together with the prescription of the side condition. For example, you can take the Laplace's equation or the Poisson's equation. You can say solve Laplacian of u equal to f and this u is 0 on the boundary. You are given with a Dirichlet boundary value problem. And then you can ask for the solution and you can say that the solution u can be written as integral of g x t f of t dt and you will say that the g is a Green's function. It is not correct to say it is a Green's function for the Laplacian. You should say it is a Green's function for the Laplacian with the boundary value problem for the boundary value problem. So, you have to specify the problem. If you are talking about the Neumann problem then the Green's function will be different. So, when you say Green's function, the question is Green's function with respect to which kind of problem? Initial value problem, boundary value problem, other types of boundary value problem, whatever it is. So, here we are talking about Green's function for the boundary value problem for the differential equation y double prime plus lambda rho t y equal to f of t. The solution has been expressed as a Hilbert Schmidt operator with an L2 kernel. Why is the kernel L2? It is actually continuous. K is a continuous function. Y, Y2 of 1 is a non-zero constant. And so everything is continuous. So it is a Hilbert Schmidt operator. That is, it is L2 with respect to the product measure. So let us examine the kernel in more detail. And so the when t is less than or equal to x, the kernel takes this form. When t is greater than or equal to x, the kernel takes this form. So, let us compare the two. Suppose I switch the roles of x and t. Suppose I switch the roles of x and t and think of g t x, then I get y 2 t y 2 x. So, this part remains the same. Look at the second part. If I switch the roles of x and t, what happens? Instead of y 2 t, I get y 2 of x. Instead of y 1 of x, I get y 1 of t. In other words, the Green's function is symmetric. So, we got this beautiful result that the Green's function g of x t equal to g of t x. What is the cause of the symmetry of the Green's function? Could we have anticipated that this Green's function would be symmetric? For example, if you look at elementary books on partial differential equations, for example, look at any book on partial differential equations and turn to the chapter on the Laplace's equation, the Dirichlet problem for the Laplacian on a domain omega. And there in that context, again, you will see that the symmetry of the Green's function is proved as a theorem there. Why is it that in these problems, the Green's function is symmetric? It could not be an accident that this particular Green's function is symmetric here and the Green's function that you saw in the chapter on Laplacian in, in a PD textbook is also symmetric. There must be a deep reason for the symmetry of the Green's function. This is related to the fact that the two-point boundary value problem with Dirichlet boundary condition gives rise to a self-adjoint operator. We are going to define the self-adjoint operator very soon. So, and the self-adjointness is reflected by the symmetry of the Green's function. Comment, since there is a parameter lambda in the differential equation, the Green's function g x t will obviously depend upon the parameter lambda. So, technically speaking, we should be writing not g x t, we should be writing it as g x t comma lambda for the Green's function. 
and we are going to expressly postulate that this lambda is not a eigenvalue. As I explained, uh, there is a corresponding Green's function for the Poisson's equation with Dirichlet boundary condition and the solution can be expressed as a Green's function and the Green's function again is symmetric in that context. And I want you to consult books on PDEs. One recommendation is Fritz John, Partial Differential Equations, the fourth edition, for instance. Chapter 4 is about the Laplace's equation. You can consult that book. Find the expression for the Green's function for a ball and verify that it is symmetric. F determine the Green's function for y double prime plus lambda y equal to f on the closed interval 0, 1 with Dirichlet boundary condition. Much simpler because this row is given to you. So you can use the previously given expression and you can actually write down the formula for the Green's function. The Green's function for a ball in Rn. Now when you look at this book by Fritz John that I talked about, in fact, you should read the text very carefully. It's a very beautifully written book on PDEs. It's a very classical book, but even today, if you want to look for a very good and authoritative account for the classical aspects of PDEs, Fritz John is the right book to read, actually. It's well worth reading Fritz John. He was a student of Richard Courant, and you already mentioned Richard Courant several times in these course. So the basic fact is that the Green's function in the context of the Laplacian is a correction to what is called as a fundamental solution of the Laplace's equation. The fundamental solution of the Laplace's equation is the Newtonian potential. Why is it called the fundamental solution? Let us not get into that. It is called the Newtonian potential. So you are, the Green's function turns out to be the Newtonian potential plus a correction term. In fact, the Newtonian potential will satisfy the Laplace's equation except when x equal to chi. At chi, this function has a singularity and you, this singularity is required and you want this Green's function to vanish on the boundary. And so you want the Green's function to be such that the Dirichlet boundary conditions are satisfied. In order to satisfy the Dirichlet boundary condition, you will have to modify by adding the correction term. This correction term is going to be a harmonic function in an open neighborhood of the closed ball B. It's a harmonic function, so it's going to be very nice. It's going to be smooth in an open set containing the closed ball. So this correction term is going to be particularly nice. So the difficulty is going to come from the singular term, the Newtonian potential. And so will this G of X chi, will this be an L2 kernel? Will it be an L2 of B cross B? That's a question. Will it be an operator of the type that we have encountered so far? I leave it to you to examine whether this one, this piece, whether that is in L2 of B cross B. It will not be in general. In fact, if n is greater than or equal to 4, this will no longer be in L2 of B cross B. So the solution operator is again of this form, u of x equal to integral g of x chi f of chi d chi. Though you got the solution uh, as an integral, the kernel is not going to be in L2 of the product domain. There will be a problem when n is greater than or equal to 4. So it doesn't fit into the scheme of things that we have been looking at so far. So far for the OD, y double prime plus lambda rho x y equal to f, where rho is a continuous function, the Green's function was actually continuous on the closed interval 0, 1 cross 0, 1. And so it is in L2. Here the situation is slightly more complicated. When the number of space dimensions is larger than 4, it fails to be an L2 kernel with the, on the product domain. So the next item that we should be looking at in the next capsule are self-adjoint operators. So now we are going to be discussing compact self-adjoint operators in a Hilbert space. Specifically, the kind of operators that arise when we solve a two-point boundary value problem, a regular term level problem with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So as a preparation for that, we will need to recall some of the notions from functional analysis such as self-adjointness. We are going to be looking only at bounded operators and compact operators in fact. So there is no problem and we will continue this next time. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच